Right, uh, good evening, everybody. We, uh, we, we've just gone past six o'clock, so we, we, uh, we ought to start. Um, can I just ask if we start with some housekeeping, please? Okay. Please note that this is the Children's Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and it is being audio recorded by the Council for the purposes of publishing on the Council's website in due course. Um, please could I all remind all councillors and officers and co-opted members to use their microphones when speaking. The meeting may also be audio recorded and or filmed for live or subsequent broadcast by members of the public. Um, please note that this meeting room is fitted with an induction loop for the benefit of hearing aid users and hearing aids should be switched to the T setting. There are no scheduled fire alarms and if the alarm goes off please leave the building by the nearest available signed fire exit route and make your way to the front of the town hall. And finally, please could I ask that all mobile phones are either turned off or switched to the silent setting for the duration of the meeting. Thank you very much. Right, first of all, a few um, new members to welcome. Um, Councillor LJ Evans has, has just joined the committee as a, as a, a new member. Um, we have Emma Hall and Simon Welsh. Um, I, I believe you are sort of uh, sharing, um, you are taking it in turns a bit, aren't you? So, uh, so you are welcome, very welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, we have um, Laurie Bradley, um, uh, John T. Spence, Amelia Mears, and Gabriel. Um, yes, you're also very welcome. Um, any apologies or substitute no, members? No, full no? committee tonight. So uh, no that's, uh, well, well, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, uh, that is a first, isn't it? Yeah, yes. So, so well, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, confirmation of minutes. Uh, as any. Oh, sorry, yeah, declaration of in interest. Sorry, I, I forgot. Does anybody have any interests uh, which are that they need to share with us? Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's probably not relevant this evening, but I would like to, for transparency, to say that I'm a governor at um, Tregonwell School, part of Ambitions Academy, and also the Bournemouth Collegiate School. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just to report that from the 1st of January, I am no longer a governor of Broadstone First School, uh, but am now a member of the Castleman Academy Trust. Right, thank you very much. Um, um, Sandra. Sorry. 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 Oh. So I'm, I'm, I was um, head teacher at St. Luke's Primary School. I'm now an education consultant, but I'm still representing and working with the diocese. Yeah, just for the purposes of transparency, I'm a member of the Teach Trust. And uh, Emma. Uh, hi, I'm Chair of Trustees at Teach Trust. Right, thank you very much. Um, it's... <laughs> Anybody who's not used these, they, they are a little bit, you have to have the right sort of fingers to work them. Um, uh, Mike hasn't got the right sort of fingers. Um, we, 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 uh, uh, we, we know. Um, but I've caught the same problem there. Jinxed it now. Um, the minutes from the last meeting. Any any issues that anybody spotted with with the minutes? No. Okay. In that case, um, can, can we take those as read? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the action sheet. Um, Uh, we've looked at the action sheet as far as I can see that the, the, there's only uh, one question I had with the action sheet but I think the person who can answer that question isn't isn't here at the moment so uh, um, any other comments on the on the action sheet no okay so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll anybody public speaking tonight I believe not. No. No. no, no. And, and questions or. Right. So um, to item six, um, school data outcome headlines. So um, the reason this is here is because members were quite keen to have an early um, oversight of this data. 
um, that they are still, so this, this is data which, which, are, which isn't validated. Um, so, so people are aware that, that there may be slight changes in, in this data at a future date, but we feel that it's quite important to see it uh, nice and early. And uh, you, people might note that school data will be coming back to a, a, a meeting in the future um, so um, with a bit more detail, and that will be in a, a part two session. Um, so uh, we'll be looking at this again slightly later. Um, so uh, has anybody got any comments uh, to start us? Sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, Neil. I, I, I was going to... I was going to say, yeah, do you have a slight presentation, something to talk about it? or um, I was going to a brief introduction, yeah, if that's that, okay. That would be great. If, if members I'll, I'll, want I'll, that, I'll, that would I'll, probably I'll, be helpful. I was going to say, could, could you keep it nice and, nice and brief? Um, because oh, we I have, can be brief. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, firstly, can I introduce members to Julia, Col oh, Julia Coleman, who is the Head of School Improvement, who has joined us this evening, and will answer all your technical and difficult questions about the, about the data that's before you. So between us, I hope we can answer your questions. This is clearly a really key paper for, for BCP, uh, for the Council, the outcomes of children at the, the ex uh, from the exams uh, of last year. Uh, the Chair spoke about this being an early site of this. It might not seem very early, given that the exams were last summer and it takes a long time to go through the process. Um, but... It takes a while for, for the results to be approved uh, and validated, and so we have to come through in a, a, as part of a process. Um, also, as the chair said, this isn't the final set. The, the final set of finally validated data will come through. It should have been here now, by now, but um, DFE are slightly delayed, presumably because of elections and other things that they've been, uh, been dealing with. And so, uh, as the chair has already said, we'll come back with some more detailed uh, figures um, for you to consider at, at another date. So this is headline figures for, for outcomes. What we've provided is in the form of a presentation, but we don't intend to do a presentation tonight. Hopefully you've had a chance to, to look through it. Absolutely happy to answer questions. What you've got is some context. If we look at the presentation about a BCP, which we always think is worth stating just to give you an idea of the size and scale, particularly as we, we still can say we're new to some extent, how many schools, how many pupils, those sorts of things, and then a breakdown of the results across the different key stages from early years to key stage five um, post-16 qualifications. Um, like I say, we can answer questions about those in detail. I think in general, this is a positive picture. There's lots of good news in here, but when you dig into it, as you would expect us to do, there are lots of areas for focus and things that we'd want to improve on as well. And we can draw out some themes if that would be helpful and answer your question. So is, is that a, a, enough of an introduction so we can just that, 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 go by your questions? That, that, that is perfect for me. Okay. Thank you. Peter. Thank you very much. What I'd like to ask is on some of the um, tables that are in the echo, it does concern me, especially with some of the... I knew when I was a governor at the um, <coughs> Pratchett's Junior School, and I'm just surprised at some of the marks that they've got. I mean, when you've got Burton Primary in Christchurch down to 59% and, and the average is 65, it just seems that why are we below so much? And other schools, Summerford won 52%. Um, what are we going to do to increase their percentage or, and improve the things that are missing at the moment? Absolutely. So the, the, the figures you've got in the presentation are a summary level, so we don't go down to individual school level. So we're looking at BCP as a, as a total. I think in the next conversation about this, we can talk at detail about individual schools when we have validated data. But you are right to raise concerns. Not all schools are delivering the level of outcomes that we would want to see, and we are working with them, and Julia's team, and she can talk about that, about how we're working with them. Schools are engaging with us very positively with a new organisation. That's been uh, really encouraging, uh, and we are working together on that. Schools are working together. That's also very uh, encouraging. We have a learning partnership board that's looking to drive up standards across all schools within the area. So there's lots of work going on, and I don't know if, Julia, if you wanted to comment on, on the primaries particularly. But that doesn't mean that we don't have priorities and we don't have concerns. Um, when we come back in March, we'll be looking at individual schools um, and we share our concerns about individual schools, even at this stage with Ofsted, which we did last week, 
uh, and with the regional schools commissioner who's got responsibility for academies and obviously we work with those schools directly and one of the things about the new BCP team is we're back in a situation where we have a named advisor for every single school so all of the schools where we're worried about dips in performance or where we're worried about some of the thematic issues that come up in the presentation we are starting to work with them the other things that the other reason why we get a bit cautious about what we say about individual schools is that one of the things that we really need to get under the bonnet of is are those schools whatever the headline data says doing really well with the groups that are actually underachieving in the area and so there will be some schools where their attainment which is their raw unvalidated score looks a certain way now but in two weeks time when the contextual data comes out you'll actually see some schools who've taken children on a very dramatic journey um, and we only have one school in the whole area that Ofsted would kind of say is a stuck school a bit stuck in the grade that it's got and so on we literally have one in the whole area so it's not to say that there aren't individual schools that we're worried about we are but we're very careful about judging them at this stage because in two weeks time we'll actually know how much value they've added in terms of improving the results for individual children in their school thank you very much um, Sorry, Mark. Um, is it my understanding that the academy agenda depowered the the role that the local authority had or could or the levers that the local authority had to challenge schools to support schools and a lot of schools would say they were answerable to the regional schools commissioner when they came down to academy status and now the local authority seems to be um, taking a stronger role in, in school improvement which I'd, I'd, I'd welcome. Um, are there any schools that are using, are, are, are resisting the support or avoiding um, the, the, the support and offer that the local authority are giving? Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, yeah, sure. okay. Just to pick up in the first instance. So to start at the start of your question, I think that the move to academisation changed the role of the local authorities but didn't necessarily weaken it. We remain responsible for yeah. all the children. All of them are our children and we are responsible for the outcomes that they deliver. Local authorities will respond to that challenge differently and some have taken a step away from what might be seen as traditional school improvement and had a lighter touch and others have taken a different approach. I think BCP, as it's being established, is looking to be very much in that ar arena and um, Julia's already said that we've now got a school improvement officer allocated to every single school. I think it's fair to say all the schools are uh, engaged with that. I don't think we've got any schools withdrawing from that. And we are very clear that we have a clear responsibility for the outcomes of all children across all schools. And so we don't... Um, uh, treat schools in this arena differently because they're academies particularly um, some some schools are in academies that are very large and have their own improvement resources and we want to work with them we don't want to you know take away from that that's part of the reason of having academies others are standalone or main maintain schools and so we work with them so there are differences but our commitment to uh, supporting them is 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 the same and actually I think that's been very clear from the start of BCP and that schools mm -hmm. have universally I think engaged with us very positively. Thank you very much. Make the microphone work. I think it's fair to say that it's a complicated arena. It's a complicated uh, legislative framework within which local authorities still operate, um, and it's a it's a complicated mm -hmm. governance arena across the whole of the country. Uh, I, I would completely support what Neil has said, but add to it that we are, like all authorities, working very hard to have a meaningful relationship with the regional school commissioner. Already met with her. If we had some concerns about a school that happened to be an academy we would share that in a very transparent way and that is the local authority discharging its duties and using all of the levers that we have at our disposal in order to champion children and uh, enabling them to access good education yeah. um, Mike yeah, oh, sorry I missed you a moment ago so um. Aha, the finger is back um, First of all, I think, uh, thank you, Neil, for, for, for this report. I think there are some uh, really positive elements within it, um, and I want to keep it as, as general as I can. Um, and I've picked up 
probably four or five items that I think we, we potentially need to need to look at at, at different different levels. Um, so, if I may, firstly, in the early years, it is paramount. Um, we pick up on what we need to focus. There's a list there on page 25, and I think that that list is absolutely spot on. But I think it's missing one item, um, and that, with the risk of being accused of uh, gender bias or sexism or, or whatever, we ought to have in there as well that the books are appropriate to the gender of the children. And I'm going to give a personal example, if I may. When my granddaughter was in, I think, year, year two, she was given a book on scaffolding to read. And while, yes, there are ladies who work in the building industry, um, it has been very, very difficult to get my granddaughter to read since that, having that book, because she found it so irrelevant to her and her environment. Um, and I think, therefore, we need to look much more closely at how we decide on what books are appropriate to the boys and the girls. And we know, uh, as time goes on, boys tend to read more technical things or have done in the past. Um, and I know I tend to read technical things rather than novels. And we've got to encourage reading throughout. So I, I just raise that as my first point, quite happily to be shot down. <laughs> yes, so please, please, please do. I, I might defer to educational experts, but I will give you what the, some of what the evidence says. There isn't. Uh, thank you for sharing your personal experience. Um, it does have value. I'm not sure the evidence would completely bear that out. What the evidence will say is we need to have a, more, a whole range of reading materials available to all children in schools, from comics all the way up to really complicated technical reading material or novels, because all children are different, and different children will connect with those materials. And that's what the... Um, that's what the evidence would say. There is some evidence for certain children if we took w walked away from reading in terms of writing and the importance of mark making. Again, particular interventions that I know some of our education leaders in the early years have already led in terms of encouraging all children to start to write and make marks, even though they might not be presenting as wanting to do that. Um, so thank you for sharing your experience. I think we need to promote a wide range of reading materials. There isn't evidence to suggest it's one gender or another. Thank you, Chair. I, Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree but with that. Can, can I, can I, I just... I, be, be, I needed a starting point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry, can I, Michael, is, is, this, is the same point? Because I just wanted if anybody else had got anything to say on, on this, that point before you move on to your, your, your next one, if, that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. in um, secondary um, about catching up reading but what we need to do is look at how we do that from naught to 25 all the way through so that as they get excited by reading that's carried on in the next organisation that takes them on and the next organisation that takes them on it is, uh, yes Hi, um, yeah, page 23, uh, the pupil and student context in 2018 and 19. I was just wondering if anyone knew the first point was children eligible for free school meals. Uh, I was just wondering what category is children? Is it uh, primary, secondary, key stage one, two, or three, or four? Because I'm personally key stage four. I'd like to know that statistic because that interests me within my school. Are you, are you able to? <laughs> um, so that's overall children eligible uh, for, for free school meals across all the schools. Now you'll be aware, you might be aware that with the introduction of universal school meals at infants, the figures have become slightly um, more complex than they were uh, originally because of course if every child is uh, eligible for universal free school meals, then it's unless likely the parents are going to go through the application process because they'll get them anyway. But yes, it's, it's from... from uh, reception year all the way through to, to Key Stage 4. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, Mike, Mike, I did cut you off. Did you see? What, are you? Um, did you have a? Um, well, um, I, I think Lisa was 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 next. If, if that's okay, and, and then and LJ. Yeah. So Lisa. Um, I'm interested in key stage. I think four to five, mainly uh, 15, 16 year olds who might have um, either withdrawn from school and then are ready to come back again, or children in care that come to us who have not had a full sort of school experience, or children that are coming from another country, particularly if um, they're separated, children seeking asylum. Uh, something I've noticed is the availability to take GCSEs um, once you get to 16. There isn't another route at that point, it, or it's very hard to access if there is in the area. Um, and also the sorts of courses are not necessarily full-time. The actual number of hours teaching are um, just really very low, just uh, maybe two or three short sessions in English as a foreign language, not the full-time education that a child that might need to catch up actually could really do with. So I just wondered if that is something we recognise as a whole in, in the uh, offer that we have across BCP because it's not anybody's res any school's responsibility to cover that, but I think it does actually, those children can fall in between the gaps there. Um, we're very concerned to make sure that there is better provision for all young people from Key Stage 4 onwards, um, and that would include children who come vulnerable into the system or join the system later, or, uh, but for all children as well, because we have uh, quite a narrow Key Stage 5 curriculum. So Key Stage 5 is your curriculum after you've finished at 16, when we're all still responsible for education. You've got quite a lot of small six forms that are aiming their, um, their offer, at, for want of a better phrase, trying to be a little bit mini-me like the grammar schools, so they think it's quite a narrow offer that they're making because I think they mistakenly sometimes think that's what parents want. So there are a number of things that we can do to influence that and we are all working on that. But it's going to involve some nudging because where schools and other organisations offer a more varied diet, actually the young people in BCP do very, very well at those. They do very, very well at retention on those courses and they do very well on progression and not becoming neat or not being at risk of being not known. All those things you're you're concerned about. So we need them to broaden the curriculum and my colleagues in um, Julian's area are looking at how could we support schools to offer a more, a, a more secure offer for some of our mo most vulnerable children but actually all children would benefit for um, a, a curriculum post 16 that offers them a, a better variety of subjects and also that enables them to do level two again if they need to but then move rapidly on to level three. So it, it's one of the things at the top of our shopping list to be working on. But you're right, we need to work with the schools, with the college, in order to do that. Thank you. Before we move on to the next, does anybody else have any comments on, on that particular issue? Or No? In, in that case, um, LJ, could I... Sorry, just going back to the last thing, there wasn't an answer about the teaching English as a foreign language. Ah, right. I think, I'm going to, I think I'm going to ask and come back with the detail. That, for me, would fit within our virtual school because uh, those young people will be in our care or will be care-experiencing people under our legislative framework. I've noted that. Thank you for that nudge. We'll, we'll circulate that with the minute. Thank you. Right. Oh. But thank you for the reminder. Um, Lisa. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I thought that was your... Uh, no, you sorry, sorry, LJ. No, sorry. So my actual question was, thank you to Mike for raising the issue, was actually about the gender balance, and um, we didn't have very, any data really about um, sort of the male-female breakdown on figures, apart from on page 26. We've got this amazing comment. Let me just find it. Um... Results are above national average for all groups except boys. That's quite a big group. So, yeah, I'd just like your thoughts on that. Um, it, it is. Um, and um, um, one of the um, 
task groups from the Learning and Partnership Board is particularly going to look at boys' achievement, their attainment, and it goes back to the earlier point made about early years, because um, Neil was talking about there's been a lot of measuring in terms of nationally and not just locally, looking at free school meals as a measure, looking at children who get uh, enhanced funding because they've uh, had experience of care or similar. But actually there's a group of children who we call the funded twos who get extra money and are in addition to the free school meals children. And early years works pretty well with that group of young people in order to make up some of the issues because for example you need to be able to speak and ask questions in order to improve your reading girls tend to arrive with a disproportionate advantage no comment um, <laughs> about their ability to speak but we also have quite a lot of summer born boys and we have young people very young children arriving into school some of them not ready to not reading ready in the same way and that's a disadvantage that boys sometimes relatively go on to have. One of the things we've started to do as a team is we are very interested in gender and making sure that the, the, the boys are advocated for, um, and particularly uh, for all boys, but dis for disadvantaged boys and disadvantaged able boys, and, disadva and send young men as well, because they are disproportionately part of all of those groups. So around send, we've got more children who are boys who... Um, have got statements, etc., etc. So we are looking at all of the different ways to tackle that issue, not seeing the boys as the problem, but seeing something in ourselves and also about how we share and repeat information because it seems to me a lot of us are working at that problem but not necessarily getting results. When you look at our selective system, if you take the sort of selective issues out you, you you discover that the girls are doing quite well so they're doing quite well in schools that aren't selective they're doing well in the selective <laughs> schools and it's the boys who uh, are not getting what they deserve to do and the risk of that is that when they get to key stage four that they get a grade four and not a grade five and then at level three they're not progressing immediately so we're actually doing some investigatory work as a learning and partnership board to look at what might be the causes of that locally Okay, is it on the, the, on the same On the same topic, topic yes, yeah. thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, so actually looking at it from the other side, um, I was just wondering how well we're doing it in encouraging girls into STEM subjects, because that's also a big problem nationally. Um, we're very passionate about that in my team, because my team emerged from what was previously the 11 to 19 team. So we do an awful lot of work with employers. We match every single secondary school in the area with a, a major employer, who works with that school around raising exactly those issues. Um, and we're, we're very excited that this year we're going to be doing our second careers and enter apprenticeship show at the BIC, um, in which uh, uh, hundreds of businesses are already signing up for that. Two years ago, we had 2,000 plus young people going, in, uh, going through the doors of that, really raising apprenticeships and all of the varied uh, different counter stereotypical jobs that there are in the area. Um, we get really great support from Microsoft, who send lots of um, very accomplished women to work in schools uh, around raising IT, STEM, and so on. It's a really big priority for us as a team. Could, could I just um, sort of ask, because it's on the same point, because um, on, on the, the uh, data, you've, you've talked about the, the national average. Do we have any data on, on our sort of statistical neighbours, whether, whether we... And 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 sorry, so, and, and are any of our neighbours likely to have a different problem or a, a different solution with the boys? I think is, is the. Um, one of the things that we're uh, we're not just waiting for the data to come out, but one of the reasons why the progress data is very important is we'll have a much more accurate picture about who our statistical neighbours are. One of the things is a, a community of people involved in school improvement in the southwest that we're very determined to be is we, we don't want to be the best in the southwest you know it's great to be the best in the southwest but we think 
that we could be doing better and for the groups that we've been talking about and there's more than just boys but for those groups that we're talking about it's really important that we do even better by them than, than we have been so what we need to do is that data will be merged with the census data which is being collected at the moment and that will tell us who our new statistical neighbours are because it is changing and we are starting to look at who they might be and how we could learn from some of them who may be doing better some of them are going to, uh, will definitely come to learn from us about some of the things that we do um, as well but yeah it, it's certainly something we're looking at right thank you um Lisa, i think uh yeah. i was actually going to ask the same question as lj the the sort of huge gender gap and being concerned for the boys um but actually Going back to um, key stage five, could I ask, um, on page 37, it uh, mentions that two subject areas are now not to be offered across BCP. And I just wondered what they might be and how much influence do we actually have on academy schools um, because they don't have to keep to the national curriculum and there is quite a lot of concern how... Um, creative arts subjects are being cut, especially I understand that in Key Stage 3 um, only about 50% of schools are now teaching music and you know when you hear about how um, gang culture is, is um, increasing and part of the research, it's, research has shown that part of these reasons are because of the cuts to creative arts in schools I just wonder how much influence we can have over the academies to encourage them to do a more rounded curriculum instead of this sort of narrow keeping to the E back? Um, it's a complicated answer. Um, uh, we have quite a lot of influence and we're definitely helped by the new Ofsted framework. Um, so the new Ofsted framework, for those of you who, who don't know, focuses much more on the quality of education. And um, we've been, uh, the schools don't always feel this, but we have been fortunate to have been visited uh, several times in both secondary, special and primary since the new framework. And one of the things about the new framework that it says is it does what it says on the tin, which is it judges leaders, it judges subject leaders, it judges local authorities, everybody, by how is that curriculum developing Lo local need what those individual children actually need and it's a challenge now that doesn't mean that there aren't still phenomenal pressures on head teachers in secondary schools and in sixth forms to perform for attainment by the government because there's no doubt that that's the case but if you look at the emerging reports from the new um, inspection module you'll see that schools like for example Broadstone Middle that has a really cracking uh, curriculum across Key Stage uh, 2, Key Stage 3. It's very engaging. It puts arts, textiles, uh, sports, as well as all of the other subjects. Children get choices about what they do uh, and how they do it and how they approach it. They went from being requires improvement to good. And I am absolutely convinced that's because they were looked at through the lens of the quality of what the children were getting. If you'd have interviewed those children as customers of the curriculum, because I was speaking to them a week before, they absolutely love the way they're learning and what they're learning. And that was reflected in the report. It doesn't mean attainment's not important, but that's an important influence, influencing factor. Of course, they're expected to perform around the EBAP as well in Key Stage 4, and that is a limiting factor. But it's very important that we do and we are doing a lot of training at the moment around uh, with governing bodies around the change in expectations of the inspectors. And the, the inspectors' change around curriculum is a very positive thing for, for children, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other... Um, Mike? Sorry. Back to me. Um, all right, fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, in a way, when I raised the uh, issue of boys right at the beginning, it was an introduction to the gender gap. Um, and I've got actually 
the Brit British Rail, a local pool station, mind the gap, is uh, something that I think crops up in this particular report in a, in a number of different ways. And if I can just raise a, a question in response to the answer that you gave earlier um, about boys and some of them, and there are inevitably some girls as well, who are not school ready uh, because of being summer borns. Uh, my wife, when she was a member in, in Parliament, did an awful lot of work and promoted um, issues around summer born, as a result of which admissions into schools were, in fact, changed. And I just wonder, um, to what extent do you get involved with parents, um, the preschools, and the, other, the, the schools, the junior schools, the primary, and so on, in discussing whether a child should offset their, their start by a year so that they can become school ready because that is possible and it would be of real benefit to those children who are not school ready as well as potentially of benefit to the schools themselves. So that's, that was the follow-up I wanted on that particular point that you raised and then I'll pick up on the other gap in my mind if I, if I may. Um, in terms of uh, the very earliest years, I think to me there's, there's two separate things. So uh, the first thing is, um, in BCP there has been some very good practice around early years education and there will be more. So that will be something that my team as the directly school and college facing group will also work with our colleagues in, in the very earliest years in the uh, private sector and also in the uh, sort of reception and very earliest stages of school. So it's, it's incredibly important to get that as right as you can. And um, what research tells <coughs> us is that the earlier that we support parents at being parents of learning as well as all of the other thing that, that, that parents are expected to do, that does have an impact. Um, and so there are lots of pieces of work that are starting both in Julian's uh, area of work and also in our area of work which will bear down on that and we will work very closely on that together. So if you look for example at Leeds which is somewhere where, where I've worked, uh, Leeds is one of the few areas where they've uh, narrowed the gap around obesity for example and done it with the most disadvantaged of families and it's been by working with families very very early on and kind of teaching really good parenting and there's been some very very good improvement in their school based outcomes as well. Around summer born it's a very um, politicised is not the right word it's something the DfE listened to a great deal I used to work at the DfE and one of the things the DfE have been saying is that they're not prepared to do much more than tinker with regulation. Every time they go near it, they, they back away from it. I think there is something about supporting families and supporting groups of children from the very earliest years um, that parents are in a very difficult situation making that call. And ultimately, it will be uh, individual schools who will sometimes give advice, sometimes won't give advice. As a council, it's so specific to an individual family. Some children, it's absolutely crucial that, for want of a better phrase, they go a bit early, but they're with a cohort of children in their local school that they play with, and therefore they will catch up. But it is a very difficult thing for parents because, of course, it can be, we'll all know, there'll all be people in this room who will be nine, ten months older than their very best friend at school, and things were very easy for them and were very difficult for their friend. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, there, there isn't a straightforward answer. What I can tell you is that we take that really seriously and we think it, it's, it's a, a very important part of that journey for us. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank any, you for any, that. Any other questions on the, the summer born I issue before we... Yes, Julian. If I could just build on what um, uh, my colleague was saying, Councillor. Um, so we understand the issue of school readiness quite well and the challenges that it can bring and to offer some reassurances around that um, uh, where historically our services, particularly for more vulnerable children who are starting school, um, uh, tended to stop as at the time that children were starting school. We understand that's not very helpful for children or their parents or for the schools. So we're extending the reach of our services from 0 to 5 through to the end of their reception year because the reception year is 
probably one of the most pivotal time for especially our vulnerable children and that's time we should be wrapping our resources around children uh, in, in schools as opposed to walking away i think that's coming to effect almost immediately in terms of that extension of reach just to reassure you really cancer right so mike you you had a, a gap two. A, a gap two yes, yes. um maximum and minimum and especially with key step with key stage four has um increased significantly from the previous year and this i'm assuming if i'm interpreting the figures correctly the the schools that are getting the highest are you giving you the maximum for their their cohort compared with school in the borough that is getting the worst performance or the minimum performance It worries me that it ties in, in a way, with the, the maths performance at Key Stage 4 as well, which seems to be um, a very, very significant thing. Is that a blip or is that a downward trend uh, in the boys' performance in maths, which was raised earlier? Are we looking at that maximum, minimum performance between schools and looking at how uh, we can help and support those schools that are currently or would appear to be uh, getting a worse score this this year than than last year. And again, are we looking at blips or are we looking at trends? It's difficult to to raise the sort of questions without that little bit wider and longer information, which we we discussed in the past um, about about trends. Do that one. Yeah. So as we said at the start, this, this, these are headline figures, and I think you're absolutely right to identify the need to look at trends and you understand the complexities of that and the predecessor councils are moving through. Absolutely, when we come back in March, we want to look at the trend over time uh, and look at where that, that, that is going. In terms of the information that you've got in front of you, um, absolutely this is an area of focus. This has been presented to the Learning Partnership Board. They're very clear of this. Um, we'll be looking at it at an individual school level and putting in support where that's needed. Uh, and what, uh, ensuring that the, um, the issues that have led to this are very well understood. But as I said at the start, it, this is still quite early in understanding the breadth of BCP as a new organisation and, and as a new schools. We're working really closely with the schools. We know where this is coming from. But in answer to your, your question, is it a blip or is it a trend, I think I'd like to answer that in, in, with more data than, than we have at the moment, if that's, uh, if that's acceptable. That's that's fine, Neil, as long as we do answer it and that we look into the, A, the reasons that are revealed by the trend and then put in the necessary support or develop the support that will enable those schools or those individuals to up, up their game, shall we say. And then my final point, Chair, yes. several of the others have been already been raised. Um, key stage five and the curriculum which Lisa um, talked about how far apart from I know that Poole Grammar School and Parkston Grammar School share at sixth form level some of their courses um, the girls go into the Poole Grammar School to do one subject some of the boys go into Parkston Grammar School to do another subject what I'm looking at is are we actually ex trying to extend that curriculum sharing between schools and between neighbouring schools. It's something when I was teaching, we were looking at and talking about, but never did anything about. So your curriculum narrowed when you only had two or three sixth formers wanting to do a particular subject. Whereas if you had been able to get a little consortium of schools and move around, you could actually offer those, those particular sub subjects and therefore you had that width the breadth of curriculum, the, the, the width of experience, which is, so, which is so important at that sixth form level. So I just wanted to raise that idea of sharing. I know it's not a new idea, but it's one I hope that we are going to encourage schools to, to look at. So, so absolutely is the answer to that. I think that is something that we'd very much like to encourage. I think the starting point, though, is there is not a huge amount of that within the borough. I think Parkstone and Pool may be the only shared sixth form or shared that, sh that work in that way at the moment, but it's absolutely something we want, want to work on. I think the point Julia made earlier about um, our, our sixth form sometimes being uh, somewhat 
cookie cutter. You know, they're, they're very similar. And actually, if you had a breadth of, of, of offer um, and an individual approach to what the community needed around that area, we'd, we'd be more successful in doing what we need to do. And that's absolutely a huge focus for it. Julia's team are working really hard to broaden the curriculum at sixth form. But the points you're making are absolutely right from a financial, from a breadth of curriculum perspective, from an offer perspective, absolutely want to look at a much more shared uh, uh, offer. And our role is to step back and look at the offer across BCP as a whole. I mean, we have we have pupils who have to, who choose to go outside of our area for sixth form provision. We know they go to Brockenhurst College or, or other places when actually we should have the capacity to to meet those needs not for everybody because there will be particular issues i'm sure but we need to be better at meeting that breadth of of um uh, of need and your point is really well made about the the collaborative sixth form model and something that learning partnership board will absolutely want to be discussing about how we can make more of that within the bcp area a note of caution because i'm sure you'll ask us to come and report back that it's been tried in lots of places 10, 15 years ago in London where the public transport was very different to here. It wasn't a semi-rural and more urban area. And even in those contexts, it was quite difficult. There is a financial model which supports schools being financially viable. Six forms sometimes cause a strain on that. But of course, we have to have empathy for head teachers and governors who are also trying to attract the best staff and subject matter experts, of which are linked to the A-level offer, and also what parents are saying that they want in terms of a local school that goes right through to sixth form. So we will be, as Neil has said, I know Julia was keen to come in, have already started to have conversations about what does a good and rounded offer look like post-16, including with our college colleagues. Um, but we need to be really clear, going back to the question about are we using all the levers, we are an influencer, we are the champion of children, we need to bring the voice of the parent community to the table and we need to, I suppose, start those negotiations that will take time from a point of empathy for, for school head teachers who are in competition for pupils at times. So it's a complicated arena and I, I wouldn't want to leave it without underlining that at risk of we're asked to come back and say and what was the impact of that negotiation that's not a quick win that's a building a mature um, system uh, system leadership approach where we all own the outcomes and life chances of the community of children as a whole rather than tiny pockets of community which is one of the benefits of being a larger a larger area we would hypothesize so uh, i just wanted to add the complicating factors there Right, thank you very much. I, 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 unless there's any more um, questions, I think we've probably um, got to come towards the end of, of that. Um, just to, to try to sort of sum up sort of some ideas, what we think. I, I feel that we, we all would like to sort of say that we, we have some good points with this, uh, and I'm very pleased with, with, a lot, with a lot going on. Um, the gaps, I think, is, is what everybody is saying, the, the various gaps, particularly the, the, the gender gap um, that, that, um, that, that we're concerned about. Um, and um, so, so, so that, that is an area I feel that we would like to focus on in the future. Um, the, the data, um, looking at um, the data set is also something that I think that um, look, looking at our near statistical neighbours that, that, that we're keen to, to, to compare. Um, and finally, the, um, the Key Stage 5 uh, curriculum sharing, I, I think there's quite a lot of interest with that. I, I get the, the idea. So that's that's something I think we'd also like some information on in, in the future. Okay. Um, so, um, it item seven then, um, the um, Children's Services Restructure Update. Um, so, so um, Children's Services Restructure is of quite high priority, uh, um, and that's uh, important updates on the progress, I, I feel, um, because of conflicting pressures requiring careful judgment. Um, is, is anybody presenting? Good evening, yes. Right. Uh, yes, um, my name's Jane White. I'm the um, Service Director for Children's Social Care and Youth Offending. And this report in front of you is a combined report with input from myself and my colleagues sat around the table. So I'll start with the journey so far. I think you'll, you'll find that over the last nine months there's a huge amount of work has been going on in children's <laughs> services. Um, starting with um, consultation around the single management structure and operating model 
that we wanted to move forward with. And as a result, the Tier 3 posts, which were Julian, Neil and myself, we were all appointed to the service back in s September. Um, and we have been part of the moving forward in terms of redesign of the services as a team. Um, during the summer of 2019, uh, we started work on the consultation uh, and recruitment of the service manager group who sit under us as a team. And we successfully managed, managed to recruit our service manager group. Um, and we, have, we still have one tier four post that we're appointing to and have had some interest in. And we're just clarifying where we go next with that. Um, Underneath the service managers, the team managers within the service were also um, agreed uh, during the summer in September. So in terms of children's social care, um, we've moved forward with the whole restructure of the service. It was felt to be a priority to, to move forward with children's social care. And um, we have been working, we've recruited um, all of our managers. We have permanent managers in post and we have... Um, we're currently advertising for social workers. We have, I think, 23 agency social workers in post, post at the moment. That's partially due to the fact that we, um, we didn't bring any social workers over from Christchurch, so we, we, we have a new team that we didn't have anybody in. Um, but I'm glad to say that the, the recruitment campaign is starting to make a difference, and I believe we appointed four social workers to our team on Friday during interviews, and we have um, monthly interviews in place. Uh, hopefully we'll have another, uh, more interest coming up. Um, in terms of the front door of children's social care, we know there's work to do. Um, we're working with our partners in practice, as you'll, you'll be aware, uh, from North, North Tyneside. And uh, I've been out there today and we're working with our partners in the local area to, to shape our front door uh, to give a, a good response to, to children and young people at the very start of our service. We co-located our assessment team, so we did have an assessment team based in Poole and an assessment team based in Bournemouth. They're now both sitting together in Bournemouth Learning Centre, and uh, we now have one service manager overseeing the whole of the children in care and uh, care experienced young people, um, cohort of young people that we have. We have one fostering team now, and we've recruited a, a, a panel chair, and so they're all working together trying to harmonise practice across the service. And um, whilst we're not co-located yet, because we're still on that journey, we are trying to really combine those teams, align practice and harmonise our way forward. So in terms of children's social care, we are in a place now where we can start thinking more about quality, more about ensuring that we're moving forward in the right direction and responding to children and young people and I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to just give you an update on the rest of the children's services, if that's okay. So um, uh, Jane has given you uh, an update on the restructuring on children's social work. Um, uh, I'm responsible for uh, a service unit called Inclusion and Family Services. Um, it includes four discrete services, um, the virtual school, um, the uh, SEND service, and there's two services called Early Help, Early Help 1 and Early Help 2. Uh, they're subject to renaming, to be fair. Um, uh, so in terms of the progress made in relation to those four services, um, the virtual school, which is a responsibility for supporting schools in promoting the best outcomes for children in care, um, uh, was previously uh, two individual virtual schools, and they were restructured into a single, uh, single uh, service or virtual school um, uh, midway through this year uh, at the time, just post LGR actually um, and that's a stable model of uh, service delivery supporting all our schools um, and children in care and more generally so that is complete um, and there's a good um, uh, strategic uh, board providing governance to the virtual school and the work that it does and actually make sure we keep a really close eye on the outcomes of our children in care um, the second service um, the SEND service, Special Educational Needs and Disability Service um, which includes the statutory SEND team who administer all the statutory processes around special needs, in particular um, education health care plans. It also includes the educational psychology service and the portage home visiting service um, and the children with disabilities um, service. Um, went through a process of con consultation and um, uh, service reorganisation uh, November last year 
and completed its uh, reorganisation and restructure um, uh, in the first week of January. Um, so that uh, restructure is, is complete, um, which leads to other services, Early Help 1 and Early Help 2, um, which are probably the two largest services, um, and their future structure and reorganisation is very closely linked to um, the development of, a, uh, of our Early Help approach, um, which sits in a strategic document, which I'm probably going to talk to a little bit later today. Um, our ambition um, is to reorganise those services into a way of working which really works best for our children and young people uh, in, in their families and in their communities, um, uh, subject to the strategy being signed off um, midway through February, towards the end of February. So those are restructures and reorganisations which are pending um, uh, the sign off of our future strategic intent, if you like. I'll now move across to Neil. Thank you. Um, so my service is quality and commissioning. Once again, there's four sections within that. Um, uh, and the tier four post, as described, have been appointed to other than, as it sets out in the report, the principal social worker head of QA post, which is, remains vacant. And Jane's already mentioned we're going to have further conversations about uh, this week, actually, to look about how we um, proceed with that. In relation to the other areas of, of my work, we have um, school improvement, and you met Julia already tonight, so Julia's the head of the school improvement service. That's going through a process of being strengthened to do those things that we talked about earlier to ensure we can meet the needs of all children and support all schools uh, effectively. So we're looking at how we can make sure uh, that's working. As we say, we've already got uh, school improvement advisor allocated to every single school, and we just need to look at how we can strengthen that further. They also look at uh, post-16, apprenticeships, all those other things that, uh, that, we, that we talked about. And we have the commissioning service. Um, once again, the, the tier four uh, uh, is in place uh, and the restructure will be rolled out more or less alongside the early help structure because there is crossover between the two and they look at strategic commissioning and, and operational commissioning for the service as a whole. And then finally, we have directorate support services uh, and that's very much interlinked with the work that's being undertaken corporately uh, and, and so that's being looked at in that uh, through that lens uh, rather than at an individual level. So that's a piece of work that's being, being taken forward with our corporate colleagues in terms of the broader approach to um, those support type services that's being undertaken. So lots of progress is being, ma being made uh, and we continue to work uh, to go forward. Thank you, Colin. So what you've heard there is lots of different component parts which in their totality make up what's called children's services. There are lots of colleagues in different parts of the council that also champion children and helping them to achieve um, brighter futures uh, as set out in the corporate plan who we are also working with. I think when we first came to overview and scrutiny we said we had to take a prioritised approach change represents some degree of risk in a people-based risk-based set of services as well as the capacity uh, issues across the whole council to manage this level of change so we prioritize social care uh, then into send arena early help and what some people might or might not call back office it's more than back office but some of the sort of non-family facing services we think that that's been the right prioritisation. For some of our staff, it's been too quick. For some of our staff, it's been too slow. What's amazing is people's commitment to work together through extraordinary amount of change. And if the chief exec was here in this overview and scrutiny, I'm sure he'd say, and I'll get a tick in the box by saying it's the biggest reorganisation since the 70s, uh, with lots of levels of, of complexity. Our restructure and change is located within a wider council context, of which it's a busy year of 2020 where we need to harmonize uh, and work towards with our with our staff and our trade unions what does a harmonized pay and reward structure look like all the things that the shadow authority paid close attention to and which will feature in the next year to, to two years and we need to support our staff do the day job improve where improvement is needed doing the day job as well as engage in some of the transformational thinking that the council has aspirations to, 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 to engage with. It's really important that we maintain a clean line of sight uh, on what we're doing well, what are we worried about and where do we need to improve by engaging with children and families in a more uh, strategic and comprehensive way. Uh, we, we've got a history of doing that within the SEND arena, not so much within uh, children's social care, another work that we do, and that's one of our priorities for the year. 
And also, how do we get alongside our frontline workers so that we can start to co-create what good looks like? Um, so we are looking at um, capacity for our quality assurance and learning approach. We, we've got a strategic framework. We need to operationalise that with our staff this year. And we'll be working to, to, to operationalise that with our staff. And that will be a key way of not just having what good looks like on paper, but really working with groups of staff who historically haven't worked together and creating what does good look like for BCP in regard to working with children and families, whether that's in an early help context or a statutory social work context. So um, the, the mechanics of restructure are in play and are progressing. The agenda for 2020 also has to overlay um, support for our staff, uh, management development support and a co-creation of what good looks like for us so that we can then measure ourselves and continue to improve as children need us to. Right, thank you very much. Um, can I, I think I'll start uh, on, on this one while you all have a, a think about it. Uh, um, I'm, I'm coming back to, to one of the, the, the first things. It said um, on, on page 41, not yet co-located. Um, could, could you explain the, the problems there um, uh, and why it's a problem and, and, and when is it not going to be a problem? Um, so I would reframe that and say it's an opportunity. Um, so everyone across the council, elected members, staff and the community will know that um, there's lots of different offices within which the predecessor councils used for uh, to deliver services and there's papers going to cabinet uh, in February to consider a range of options around location and facilities for the whole of the council. What I can um, assure uh, Ovian scrutiny is that children's services is not being disadvantaged in terms of we're not co-located in teams that's a pattern across the whole of the new council and we are working towards thinking which particular teams in a priority area need to be co-located and sat together not just in a linear fashion as in two bits of a fostering team now need to sit together <coughs> but also where would it make sense for a particular children's service to sit next to an adult space in safeguarding service for instance so the council as a whole is working towards what an accommodation <coughs> strategy will be and i'm keen to hear the outcomes of those those thoughts of which i i'm a part and a timeline will be drawn together as to when will teams be able to sit in the same building where it's right to do so and in terms of the only moves that have occurred in BCP thus far, um, children's services have been prioritised. Um, so lots of potential moves were paused so that we could do the big picture thinking, um, but the children's service team, the assessment teams, where it was thought to be business critical for children and frontline staff to sit together, that was fully supported. So it's, it's sat within the context of a brand new authority that needs to finalise an accommodation strategy. Happy to come back and talk about that and how that impacts on children's services and also creates opportunities for us at a future meeting. I know I'll be quite interested in that. Does anybody have any um, questions first off with, with my strand on co-location or, or, if, uh, or if not, um, any, any questions from... Yes, Mark. Just the, the, the point about the um, agency staff um, on point three, starting on page 40 and running on to 41. I presume that, that that's the, the agency staff are at a higher cost than um, the, uh, the, the current staff. And I just wondered, you mentioned about the turbulence and this amount of change. Um, have we done any work on um, the staff surveys about retention um, and what we do need to do to keep hold of the very good staff that we've got already? Um, yes, so um, agency staff does come at a cost. However, in comparison to other local authorities, I think it's 13%, uh, uh, so we're, we're doing okay. Um, we are working with our staff. There has been a, the staff survey. We're talking to staff within team meetings. I myself have been out with Julian to the MASH, the front, very front door, talking to managers and um, uh, ATMs and social workers within the team about how it feels for them. Um, I, I think that in terms of turnover, we're d we are doing okay. We haven't got lots of people leaving because of the change, so that's really positive. Uh, so we are working with our staff at all times. 
Uh, only this afternoon I've put a set of questions out to my teams about, you know, we're, we're a couple of months down the line. How is it feeling for you? So it's just about listening and working with our HR colleagues and, and trying to ensure that we're visible. Sorry, it must be tedious for you as it is for me. Sorry. Um, I think the learning from the sector is that you have to get a certain group of things in a sweet point. So you don't have to pay the most in the sector, but you have to probably be top of the middle. You have to get the balance right between caseloads and flexible working. And the learning from the sector nationally is also that you have to get the right learning offer in place. Uh, Neil and his team have done a lot of work in, 20, in 2019 to try to understand Again, using the priority approach, what was it like for our newly qualified social workers uh, in terms of the support package wrapped around them? We thought we were off the pace with the market and that was the priority area to wrap more support around those particular newly qualified workers because whilst the national evidence, a bit like teachers, there's a lifespan, there's a lifespan for social workers and getting it right from the start is an indicator for how long people will stay. We made some key changes of staff, uh, senior staff who would support those newly qualified, strong working relationship with Bournemouth University. The next layer is to continue to make sure we've got the balance right between salary, rewards, training offer, time to study and caseloads. We've got line of sight on caseloads. I think we've reported back to overview and scrutiny previously. Our pinch point is in the front door, which we've got a close watching brief on. Um, and we're continuing to work with our frontline staff to help inform what a good retention approach looks like. Could, could I just, just as follow that? You, you said 13%. Do we have any idea what, what percentage is in other authorities? Uh, I know it's a bit of a just 13%. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that's good or bad or in, indifferent. But, uh, I know it's better than other local authorities. The exact percentage, I don't know whether Neil's got the figure. I, I don't, but it yeah. was lower than the, the national and lower than our comparative authorities because that was yes. one of the points that we made in our in our presentation the other day. So uh, we can check provide the figures because we have them, but I don't have to head know what the mm -hmm. national figure is, but we are lower. I mean, I'll, I'll just be interested, just, you know, it doesn't necessarily be to, to the committee, but I'll just be interested in, in that figure. Could um, I just, sorry, could I, Chair, just make a point? I think it's important to say some of our agency staff are, are asking to become permanent as well, so that's telling us something. In, in that case, I think we're all very, very pleased about that, because I, I think, I think that's, uh, um, yes, that, that shows something. It, it does, yes. And, and there is a role that councillors play in retention of frontline staff in terms of when we run events, which we will in 2020, being able to attend and understand what their experience is like, but also championing a learning culture. Things will occur in social work and the early health arena and school improvement that were not necessarily predicted. And some councils adopt a learning culture, which doesn't mean people are not accountable and some councils adopt a blaming culture. Retention and low turnover and healthy morale are absolutely linked to senior leaders and political leaders championing a learning approach and support for the difficult role that frontline social workers and early health officers do day in and day out, as opposed to councils that adopt a blaming and name and shame. I need to lead that culture and get that right, and I would really welcome councillors' support cross-party in relation to that. LJ. So following on from what you just said, Judith, how is the council working to help you recruit? Um, because it's not only, obviously, what you're able to offer, but it's also about housing and bringing people into the area. Thank you. I think that's what the council as a whole is working through this year. We've got a whole range of work to look at to make sure that the offer is attractive, that there's learning and development not just within a very specific arena but the council as a whole and I know that various questions have been asked of me about what is the offer around key worker housing and the like and the detail is being worked up through the, through the year. I can't talk to that detail at the moment but thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Oh, Emma, wait. 
Thank you. Um, I have a generic question. I think everyone around the table will recognise the impact of transformation on your people. Um, have you noticed any impact on the front line in terms of children and families of the impact of the transformation that you've been through? I think we're really curious about that, and that isn't a glib answer. I think that's where the leadership team are at the moment, and we know that we need more feedback from ch children and families. Um, I think we've been going through a uh, transformation with a small T, which doesn't necessarily feel it, because I started my day at 8 o'clock, and Julian was saying to me, staff are chomping at the bit for what's next, because they've been waiting for two years, whereas other staff are telling me it's all happening really quickly. So we're trying to hold that. T that tension in the balance there are some communities of children that I think will have experienced a more responsive service there are some communities of children and we've had that feedback um, and triangulated that actually with some head teachers as well there are some communities of children that are still dissatisfied and I say still I don't think that's a new thing post LGR I think that that's been their lived experience and there's some children and families where the, the level of service has remained the same because the frontline staff that I'm lucky enough to in, have inherited are unbelievably committed to working hard and in a relationship-based way with the families that they're allocated to. But we need to stay really curious about that because we do need to see um, a greater degree of consistency through the year which won't happen through magic, will happen through supporting our frontline managers, start to build this joint definition of what good looks like. So we need to stay alive to that and find lots of different ways of getting that feedback. And I'm happy to share that with the OV and Scrutiny Committee late, later through the year. Right, thank you very much. Um, well, if, if there's nobody else who's got an, any questions, just, just to sort of uh, sum it up, um, I, I think we've had a... a you, you said you bring the co co-location plan back at a later date. Uh, I, think, I think I'll be very interested at that. Um, I, I, I do feel that as a, as a committee, it would be nice to, for us to say that we do appreciate uh, the, the work the social workers are, are doing, and, and, and it's really nice that, that, that we're getting some um, staff who are starting to become permanent social workers with us, um, and we, we're very encouraging, co encouraging of that. Um, I think it would be nice to have a, some feedback at a later date. <coughs> see how the numbers are going of the 13 percent and comparing with other people uh, I, I think at a later date I, I don't think you know I think we need to leave that for a little while to let them let in um, uh, has anybody got else got any comments um, about the feelings from that report okay well thank you very much um, so we, we're now on to um, item uh, eight uh, the children's services budget information so um, this report, um, we, we talked about um, bringing this to the com committee last meeting because people were curious. I know a, a couple of people were particularly interested in this. Um, so um, we feel that we are most interested in where the <coughs> overspends weren't anticipated um, and how they've been <coughs> mitigated, I think, is, is the general idea that I'm getting from, from talking to people. Um, is, is somebody um, presenting? Mike, Neil, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as you say, this report was discussed, I think, at the last board to come forward with uh, 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 a brief report, really, about the overspend that was reported in the quarter two budget monitoring. Members be aware that obviously we're moving rapidly. Well, quarter three is now finished and we'll be reporting quarter three shortly, but this, the figures in here relate to the figures that have already been reported to Cabinet through the quarter two budget monitoring process. So that's what you've got in front of you. And you'll see at an overall level, uh, Children's Services has a projected overspend for the current year of um, 2.95 million. It's obviously a significant amount. And that is broken down um, on, on the first table under point one into its constituent parts. And I think that's the, the issues you wanted to pick up with us today. So I'll introduce it briefly. And I think we would all be happy to answer questions on, uh, on the pressures that we are uh, managing and mitigations we're putting in place uh, for, to, to, to bring that down. Um, so if we look at the, under point one, the table, you'll see that the, the first two relate to the, the cost of uh, making provision, appropriate provision for children in care. Um, some of those relate to um, uh, costs for Christchurch specifically and others for Bournemouth and Poole. The budget for this year, as you'll imagine, was uh, established with the very best information available to us at the time as we went through the local government reorganisation process. But um, as we've moved on, I think it's fair to say things have become much clearer. We much better understand 
um, the costs and the pressures that are within the budget, and and that has enabled us to to be more clear about um, the budget pressures that we face, and that's what you see before you. Uh, and like I say, it's broken down between those areas that related to additional costs of the Christchurch allowance that was set up at the start of the year and those for Bournemouth and Poole. The key thing within that is the complexity of the cases, the cost of each individual placement. In order to meet the needs, the costs are accelerating. We work with a provider market. We um, work in a commissioning way with them as effectively as we can, but there are inflationary uh, pressures within that, and that's what we're having to manage. We also have some staff cost pressures around the really key areas of the service, the front door, Judith and Jane have both mentioned that already. Absolutely vital that we ensure that is working as effectively as possible. It's the point of contact um, for the, the most vulnerable, uh, and there are some additional costs in that in order to ensure that that was um, operating as it needed to. Um, business support, it was around the LGR process in the main and is about uh, the transition. It was creating capacity for, for officers to focus on what they needed to focus to, and additional uh, um, business support was put in place to manage that process, and that's within there. Um, SEN transport is a, is a significant pressure. Um, as uh, more children with the HCP have been identified, the HP numbers have gone up uh, somewhat, um, and we're having to use provision um, around the borough have to transport those children. The cost of that transport is going up. The transport is particularly expensive. The, the, the biggest element of that overspend is around uh, the staffing, around the passenger assistants who travel with the child to support them. Lots of pressure within that. Not an easy post to recruit to, um, and lots of cost pressures within there. Um, mainstream transport for those children who live the um, prescribed distance, distance away from the school, qualify for free uh, home to school transport, greater pressure than there, pupil numbers moving through the system, increased pupil numbers, increased cost pressures as well. Beyond that, there are some uh, individual pressures that are noted and um, some savings that have been uh, identified to offset that, but that leaves us with a, a, a net overspend of 2.95 million. Uh, significant work's been going on to mitigate that. All of us have been um, focused on the budget to ensure uh, that um, we are being as effective and as efficient as we possibly can, but you'll understand that a period of uh, transformation, there are many calls on the budget to, in to support the transformation and to deliver the services we need to deliver. Um, the report goes through some of those in more detail, and I think myself and my colleagues will be very happy to answer any questions about any specifics that were within there. Okay. Um, let's, who would like to start the questioning on, on the... Mike, is it? Yeah. Obviously, this is a. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you have joy with the button. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Yes, thank you. Sorry? Don't be pokey. Don't be pokey, that's right. Okay, so obviously, this is a second quarter report, and we're actually where we are now. We're pretty, pretty close to year end. So, my, question, my first question is, and. Uh, I may have a supplementary, is, is, is are we anticipating that this variance will come down significantly by year end? What is, the, uh, what is your take on this? Thank you. So thank you, that's a big question. So as, as we said, we've now completed quarter three, so quarter three was to the end of December, and we're doing our detailed budget um, reports, and they'll uh, go to Cabinet. At this stage, I think our view would be that the uh, overspend will not exceed the level that is re reported here at this stage. Things may change, but should not exceed that level, and we are working to bring it down. Um, and I think that's probably uh, as best commitment as I can give at this stage. There we go. Uh, I, I, I just feel this report looks like a cry for help. I mean, a three million variance... Is, is way and above bigger than the variance of any other service area in this, uh, in this council. And I, I don't get the sense from this report that we have a plan to meet this. I don't see what the various options are that we're considering to meet this, and I'd appreciate a comment on that. And I'm also looking at the cost for children in care. Almost half of this three million, over one and a half million, is to do with the cost of... Uh, cases for children in care and my specific question on this is how are we satisfying ourselves that we really are getting value for money from particularly some of the 
quite expensive placements in children's care. So, thank you. Okay, so um, this year's budget was always going to be um, more difficult because of the local government reorganisation uh, factor, and so there was always going to be some uncertainty about the levels of cost. As such, the council has set aside reserves that can be used to um, support where, due to changes that have happened over the course of LGR and greater clarity, they can be used to support the budget. This information is absolutely being used to build next year's budget to ensure we're not in the same uh, position again, hopefully. Um, and so within the broader council finances as a whole, there is a route to supporting this, and I think that will become clear as, as quarter three is, is um, uh, identified. In terms of the children in care costs, we do work with our provider market very closely. We commission them, we speak to them uh, consistently. The pressure to increase costs is significant. The, 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 the increases we're being asked for from some providers, 8 10% a year to meet additional costs, and that could be around staffing costs or other things, and we are working with them to, to manage that as best we can. Um, work with Jane staff about to ensure that it's the very best service for the, for the young person involved. But we do have to work with that, that, um, that market, and it is a difficult and, and challenging environment within which to work when very particular needs need to be met and the, and the number of providers that can meet those needs is sometimes very, very limited, and, and we do our absolute best with that. But like I said, I think the key thing for this is this informs next year's budget and actually says, okay, we know much more now than we did when setting an LGR. And for this year, the council as a whole, as I say, has set aside, I think they're called resilience reserves, which are available to support where um, changes in data have meant the budget set through LGR was not uh, as uh, accurate as it could have been given the, the data we had. I'm not sure I would concur that it's a cry for help. I think I'm very lucky to have inherited from the Shadow Authority resilience reserves in, in anticipation that there were some known unknowns. Uh, and certainly uh, the children in care that we are looking after who came from the Christchurch area can be quantified as known unknowns. Um, we are looking to understand some of the more complexities from children who, who we inherited and uh, aspire to look after well from the predecessor councils, Bournemouth and Poole. Colleagues and, and councillors will know in this room that um, whilst the budgets are demand-driven, we do need to make sure we're managing them well, and I take that challenge on uh, completely correctly. There was a piece of work that started... Um, quite soon after BCP went live, which was building on best practice from the predecessor council pool, which was to start to identify some particular children who, in shorthand, might be termed to have highly complex needs and have quite high costs surrounding them. And that piece of work was successful in identifying um, care provision for them, which was uh, of the same quality uh, but represented better value for money and more importantly was more local and therefore those children benefited from more intensive support from their allocated social worker and we're seeking to extend that uh, piece of work throughout the rest of this calendar year and into next and indeed that piece of work and the methodology around it will now be applied to children who are in the SEND arena where some of their needs and costs associated with using independent sector schools are driving the cost pressures that we've inherited and continue to feel a pressure in the high needs block. So the methodology was developed in Pool and the predecessor council Pool and certainly other authorities I've worked with and we've been seeking to maximise that. There are, there are growths here which are to do with SEN, transport and main seats, stream transport and certainly in the last quarter of the year I'm keen to understand the mainstream transport more. Uh, in terms of the SEN transport I've inherited, we've inherited uh, a profile of workforce which represents as Neil said probably around 50% of the transport costs and it's to do, we, we understand, I now understand more that the workforce we've inherited that has been supporting children in the predecessor councils Bournemouth and Poole, the demographic and the way that we've recruited and retained the staff leads to additional costs. Therefore, one of the priorities for BCP will be to look at um, how could we attract a different workforce where the cost pressures are not so high. So I think that 
I wouldn't concur, as I said just in summary, that this is a cry for help. I think that we are fortunate that as the Shadow Authority, which some of you were part of, really planned the budget, you did it in a mindful way, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, because some of the were, there were known unknowns where we didn't know what the cost would be, and there were some children in our system with highly complex needs where we have to provide care. We do need to engage with the market in a really robust way, and that, again, as the team uh, comes into play in BCP, we need to apply those best practice arrangements with the market. We think as a, a larger authority, we... You know, going back to the theme earlier around what levers do we have, we think we have got more levers in the market. Now we are a larger authority than any of the predecessor councils did before. So whilst we are part of uh, particular frameworks, we are now getting closer to understanding if we have X number of children in one group of um, care provision. What does that mean for our leverage? And we'll be looking to, to exploit that in the coming months. But of course, the priorities for 2020 and 2021 are also how do we create <coughs> the provision that the children who sit behind the figures need from us? We don't have, we haven't inherited, and it will take time to grow specialist adolescent services within our locality area. We have to look in through the window of budget figures because we're accountable for how we use public money and we're open to that challenge in this arena and any others. But we know that the profile of the children that are sitting behind these titles and budget lines have very complicated needs. They're of a particular age group and we haven't got that provision uh, and nor did the predecessor council. So the priority for 2020 and 2021 is to develop both assertive a flexible and uh, trauma-informed adolescent offers for children who are on the edge of care and also be informed by the best authorities in the country and we would reference there the North Yorkshire No Wrong Door and develop provision which is flexible has, has uh, accommodation for children who need to be in our care for short periods of time but very um, sophisticated and robust multi-agency wraparound care so that children don't have to stay in public care if it's not the right place for them. So I'm um, happy to bring back future reports with more detail in them. Thank you, Chairman. My main concern is I've lived in Christchurch all my life to find that um, we've got the maximum number of, home, uh, of children in care. I mean... What I don't understand, we've got a population of less than 48,000. Bournemouth's got four times that much, and there's still much less than us. So, I, And you say it's inherited. I, I find it very hard to believe there's that number in crisis itself. It does seem very high. I mean, obviously, the £3 million deficit does need to be put right. We're all here around this table because we're interested in education, and we must get that money to make sure that we can deliver the things that are in this um, agenda. So, really... I am concerned about the three million deficit, but also, are we going to get that from the cabinet? Thank you. Um, I can, I I, I'm sorry, it's how I presented uh, and didn't make clear that um, that isn't the number of children, although I did talk a lot about individual children. That's the pound signs associated with the cost of care. So the children from the Christchurch, part of our area and community, we don't have the highest number of children in our care, but the costs associated... Um, because we were accountable and wanting to make it transparent, it was important to talk about inherited costs or new costs that were the known unknowns. Um, I'm not sure whether that assures you or not. Uh, sorry, Councillor. Thank you. Um, my concern is, as councillors, we're going to have to go back to our residents and try and explain um, why there's this massive overspend. I don't feel there's really that much detail in the report. You talk about unknown unknowns. It's not like we dropped out of space to form this new authority. We were a shadow authority, and surely it, how did it come as a surprise that Christchurch had looked after children? 
Uh, Chair, these are new children that came into care very quickly after becoming uh, into BCP. So from that point of view, there wouldn't be a way that either the uh, shadow authority councillors could have known that those costs were going to come in. They're children who were in significant need that came into public care and needed to come into public care quite quickly after BCP was formed. In terms of accountability to residents, uh, I, I'm happy to make as transparent as I can the budget position, but this is part of a council-wide budget that will be balanced because of the um, prudent approach that was taken in terms of the resilience funds um, that were made available during the first year of BCP. But I might have to invite uh, Councillor Moore in at, at that point if we're talking about talking to constituents. Can, can I just, just follow that quick? Because we, we have numbers and we've talked about numbers of, of children. Do, do we have any idea about the, the, the 795,000, uh, how, how many children that would actually represent? Um, I don't off the top of my head, but we can make that visible. I don't know whether it's embedded in the report. I doubt if it is because we have to hold the balance of not um, getting into small numbers where small less than a number we would never put in a report because potentially <coughs> children are identifiable but we could certainly make that available I was, I was just thinking go, going back to what LJ said it, it was an easier conversation when you say it is you know this amount of money means so many extra children have come into care or it represents this number of people um, might, might be a, a, a way of discussing it um, rather than numbers because children are, are what we're here for rather than Are you following up from this? Because I'm just uh, Peter's got a, got a point. Uh, is it from? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is, is it from? Um, with this definite of a money um, we you've come about, um, will it affect the forthcoming council tax bills? <laughs> because um, people will notice, you know, if council tax bills go up, will it affect any way at all? So uh, that's a political decision, so I'll leave so, it so to I, my I, portfolio I think, holder. I think that, that takes perfect over to, to you can, you can do, do with, with uh, two. Yeah, in a word, no. Um, we're, we are working to a set council tax and we are working to get this budget under control. I was just going to say about the, the number of the children in care. I have been to, I think it's the ONS board, on two memorable occasions to um, look at this budget. But the, the, the number of, uh, when it comes to the children in care, it was the complex cases. And I have got... Um, and somebody very kindly provided me with a list, but there was there was there is one instance of, of, of a young person that cost something in the region of half a million pounds, um, you know, and, and, and that sort of level. And adult social care, interestingly, have got the same sort of problem because obviously, as the children grow up, so they go into adult, and that costs money as well. So I can find that email, and I can send it around if you if you would like. Um, but in terms of the council tax, this, this is all part and parcel of the budget. It will all come out, what is it, um, February, February, February council. And uh, we, we are, um, you know, aiming to keep the whole thing under control and no, no massive council tax increases, partly because we're not allowed to. You've got 2% for the adult and 1.99% max. So, you know, that's, that's, it will all be under control, so don't worry. The, the only other thing that we were looking at um, was, the, um, was, was the transport, because there, there's clearly things that we could do at that, with that. So we were actually doing, a, you know, micro-managing the, the, um, the actual budget for that. But the, the rest of it is actually, don't forget, a needs-led budget. If, if children need help, they've got to have the help. You, you can't just turn the tap on and off because, oh, can't do it, no money. You can't do that. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. And Judith, you... Uh, uh, just, just two final reflections and happy to bring briefings so that people can engage with the conversation through a different lens as well. Managing the market is what people would talk about, going to how do we lever the best cost for the best quality care. It's a challenging market. There's a national issue around that, so happy to make that visible to future committees. But in terms of what can councillors do to help with this, uh, we need foster carers who are experienced parents who have got high tolerance levels for at least average adolescent behaviour 
as well as children who have suffered extreme trauma. It's a particular group of parents or carers in the community. They might be slightly older. They might have already had children who've left home. They might have had different and diverse life experiences. So councillors, you can have a direct impact on helping us to manage the market. And one of them is flying the flag for helping us recruit foster carers not foster carers who want to have the baby in arms but foster carers who are experienced in life have high tolerance levels are quite laid back uh, that is one of our needs so it would be great if you could go and champion that thank you Judith. Um, mike you have so i just wanted to come back on this point on a council tax increase i mean it's obviously reassuring to hear this won't affect council tax increase because in any case we have limits on that but the point I would suggest and make is that uh, were it not for this three million overspend we could actually be looking at a council tax decrease thank you I'd say that doesn't it suggest that there just needed to be a bigger allocation to this budget in the in the first place and so instead of putting a bigger budget allocation in the first place they put it in some reserves or resilience fund and it just demonstrates that in the following year we've got to have a bigger budget allocation Jude, can you, uh... I won't comment on that because it, <laughs> it is <laughs> um, uh, you can you can guess what my head might be thinking um, uh, what I would say is um, there's, we have spent a few months now identifying children whose needs we could meet better and whereby if this money wasn't being spent, I can assure and make visible to the committee uh, a whole new load of uh, meaningful and valid investments. Um, there's lots to do for the community of children in BCP. Uh, we are committed to do that uh, and, and I, we take the challenge on uh, in its meaningful way that we will be making sure that we achieve best value for money and we don't take the position in a, in a light way. Right, thank you. Are, are there any? Yeah. Um, Peter. Thank you, My last question is just that um, our officer mentioned that one of the costs going up is transport. I was amazed to find when I asked a question about the building that um, NEAT students use in Christchurch, in one month they had 1,800 just spent on taxis. I just wondered how much is spent on taxis when you say the transport. Are you talking about taxis or general transport with buses or coaches? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so the, the mode of transport will reflect the needs of the particular individual uh, or, or child. And so, for example, if we're transporting um, a four-year-old, um, we're unlikely to give them a bus pass. That's going to be um, either a, a, a taxi or a, or a, a bus pass with their parent to, to transport at the same time. In terms of the learning centre that you, you, you talk about, um, it will depend on the needs of, of the, the child um, uh, individually. And, and sometimes that will be a taxi. And sometimes some of our schools aren't on bus routes and aren't easily accessible through public transport. There's a whole range of things that come into what, are, what is the best way of getting that child to, to school. We have um, within the council uh, uh, an integrated transport unit who do the commissioning of, of the transport for us so we hand that on to them and they commission for the whole council not just for children's services uh, and they look at how we can as effectively as possible make sure that the transport you know um, is, is cost effective so they look at routes to make sure you know if you can pick up more than one child on the route to a, to a school or provision that's undertaken and those sorts of things but it is a very individual decision particularly for children who are going to be alternative provision placements like the one you're talking about depending on their needs depending on the route depending on the times of travel and all those sorts of things but like I say that is considered as part of a very um, a considered approach to transport as a whole not just on a uh, you know a child is identified we, we put in place a taxi it's, let's look at the whole cohort of children and how can we uh, transport them as effectively as possible right well, thank you if there's no ex more points on that I suppose it's uh, I need to bring some sort of summary to what what we think on, on this um, I, my, my feeling is is that that we, we have some concerns about this 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 overspend um, we, we, we have some questions about it keeps coming back why, especially the two big figures at the top, why we didn't know 
uh, that that was going to come, but we have some reassurance that that it isn't going to uh, cause uh, direct problems this year. But um, we, we want some more reassurance that it won't happen again. I think is, is the is the uh, and how we can mitigate it from happening again. Um, I would suggest now, because we've had quite a, a busy session, that we have a, have a short break for 10 minutes to, to recharge our glasses and, and have a comfort break um, before we come back to, to finish off the, the, the session. If we all in agreement with that. Um, I, I, was, I was going to do the forward plan after the break. Uh, so. well, if, you did, if you just did the forward plan now, then uh, you could excuse me. Right. Yeah, in, in that case, it, if, if, we, if we can hold on for a break for a moment... Um, we'll, 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 we'll do the we'll do the, the forward plan and that, then we'll have a short break. I think I think it's the um, um, so um, just a couple of things to highlight on on the forward plan. Um, we're looking at um, added school performance monitoring, which we've talked about uh, earlier on, which has been added to the forward plan. Um, we are proposing a, a program, a, a program session early in March, um, looking at um, working on the forward plan, and I think you'll all be getting invites uh, for that coming round soon. We're just trying to um, decide on the dates that are going to work for people. Um, there, um, and there will also be some um, s next municipal year there will be some development sessions play taking place which um, will be on the forward plan as well um, are there any other questions about the, the forward plan Chair I would like to change the wording on item 7 in, in March I, I would suggest that we DCP can draw improvement plan update and it's the impact so So impact and change. Yeah, and then it can pick up on the question of what, what's the change for children. Okay. I'm happy with that. Is everybody else happy with that? And, and, yeah. and the other, the other change, and change would, yes. Chair, the other change that I would respectfully suggest is that in Section 9, notwithstanding that I know Committee wants to understand the impact in regards to figures, um, there's been a lot of development work across agencies on developing a strategy around child um, exploitation. So I wonder whether that's what the Commission would like to have uh, an update on, um, the development of a strategic approach to identify, disrupt and minimise child exploitation in our area, which of course needs to contain uh, a line of sight in terms of frequency and numbers, if that's acceptable. Um, Eddie, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, but if we can have the numbers as well. Mm. But yes, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. We, we need to move forward and how we deal with it and get the numbers down. Thank you. So, so we're agreeing both. Yes, but yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take away from the figures, but there are a lot of development work going on. Okay. Any more points or questions on the forward plan? Um, and, and, and in, in, in that case, uh, um, we're we going to the, the, the last section. Just uh, the dates, sorry. Oh, sorry, just the dates. dates yeah, so yeah. The, the, the dates are, are to note, and um, I noticed that some of the dates don't don't have a venue. But I, I would imagine that we're going to continue the same pattern yeah. of um, of moving from 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 here to Christchurch and then back to Paul because I think that seems to work. And I, I can't see an advantage in changing that. Um, Less parking becomes a huge yeah, issue here, and, and we may, because we know parking in Christchurch is not a problem. Um, <laughs> so um, we're coming to, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a, a break now, and then um, after the break, um, we'll, we're going to go into um, a closed session. Um, so. Um, We'll have a ten minute break and then see you in, in about, about about ten minutes. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we're um, coming to um, 
uh, agenda item um, 11, um, which is exclusion of the press and public. Um, so in relation to this item of business appeal below, the committee is asked to consider the following resolution that under section 100A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting uh, due to uh, paragraph 4, part 1 of 12A of the Act. Um, are, are, we, are we all happy to um, um, do that? Any? any? <laughs> so, so in that case, I, I need to ask anybody who's not part of the directly part of the committee um, if, if they would mind leaving, please. <laughs>